listening to the Sexual Happiness Podcast from Love Honey, the podcast where we answer your questions about sex and sex toys. I'm Anna, and this week we're joined by Sarah Melinda. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> oh, really excited to have you. This is great. Today, we are going to be talking a little bit about um, sexual health for mainly cisgender women and people with vulvas. And Sarah, you are the perfect guest to have for this. I think a couple of listeners may recognize your name where I've said it there. Would you mind telling us a little bit about you, what you do, your experience? Okay, so I'm Sarah Melindwa. I am a qualified nurse. I've been a nurse for 14 years and I specialize in sexual health. I'm also a TV presenter and I host a show called The Sex Clinic on Channel 4. Amazing. I've watched the sex hit before and if anyone hasn't seen it, very valuable show. Definitely, definitely recommend going to watch that. So just quickly before we hop into our main topic today, we have a part of the show um, called You Can Never Know Enough About Sex, which is where we share a sex fact that we've learned over the course of the week or, or, you know, something that you've learned recently. Do you have a sex fact for us? I do. And this one sort of... um... This one sort of spun me a little bit because I kind of knew it, but not in the way that it was phrased. So the sex fact that I recently discovered is that any any male human, their sperm that they can accumulate within two weeks is enough to impregnate every fertile woman on the planet. (laughs) Which Which blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind because if you think about it, there are approximately 3.5 billion women females in the world and so to think that one male can impregnate every female on the planet is crazy yeah so that's the the sex fact that I learned in two weeks oh my god you know in in one ejaculation of of a male is approximately a million sperms that are ejaculated so I kind of knew that fact of course um but when you when you phrase it in in that term it's like wow oh wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's quite unsettling <laughs> it's insane yeah so I look at men very differently now <laughs> wow yeah. yeah yeah that's a great one thank you Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a study done in uh, 2020 in January um about well they spoke to um, millennials and did a big survey about relationships and things like that and they found that actually one third of Americans say that their ideal relationship is non-monogamous, which mm. I was quite surprised because it is a big percentage. And yeah, like I know that um, I know many people myself who are in non-monogamous relationships. Um, it's something that I think, you know, I, I, I was aware that the like idea and understanding and um the action of it was something that is appealing to more and more people for many, many reasons. But mm. I hadn't quite realized that it was as many as a third would say that it is their perfect relationship type, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I think that's interesting. And honestly, from, from my perspective, you know, in terms of what I do and like sexual health, and I see God knows how many people in a week, but I can I can probably vouch for that a little bit. I do see it is mm. kind of more and more of a thing. Um yeah, so I, I, but like you said, I it's a higher number than what I would have thought. I think a third is it's inter- that's an interesting fact. Yeah, mm. yeah, and I I suppose that well, this is me theorizing. I, I could be completely off base here. I do wonder if part of it's to do with um, like a, a a culture that we are building quite successfully at the moment within society around you know like mental health and self care and things like that. And mm. part of me wonders if it's one of these things where people feel like this obviously isn't the case for everyone. This is a complete theory. Um, (laughs) You know, I think that um, previously a lot of people have put pressure on their partner to be, you know, your best friend, your confidence, someone that you go and have loads of fun with also Mm. someone you have loads of sexy times with. And if you look around at your friendship group, for example, you have a different friend, you have lots of different friends who all fulfill different roles in your life. Right. Right. And I wonder if people are, kind of taking that understanding of friendship groups and different people for different things and different people fulfilling different needs and then taking that to a relationship perspective as well I wonder if that's where it's coming from I might be completely wrong yeah no I think (laughs) no I think I agree with you I think the way in which we approach relationships I think we're a lot more um emotionally mature 
in our mm. generation. And um, I think there's a lot more, convers- we have conversations a lot more than say, you know, maybe our parents or our grandparents, you know, and our forefathers. And so I think that now people are more expressive and we feel more mm. um, able to sort of, um, you know, have those conversations and and also kind of remove the emotional attachment from certain situations as well um, mm. and look at sex from a different perspective, um, whereas before more traditional way of approach, um, you know, was m- more sort of binary and more kind of, yeah, monogamous and things. And don't get me wrong, of course, the, and you know, like the study says, the majority of people still would prefer to be in a monogamous relationship, but then mm. that's... Th- not everybody's that look that way. And I think we kind of moving towards a thing of um, sort of stepping away from, okay, this is what society says you should be, but actually not everybody's going to fit into a certain box and that's okay. And yeah, I think people exactly. feel a lot more liberated to kind of live the lifestyles that they see fit for themselves. So I think that's definitely, um, yeah. So I, I agree with that statement for sure. Yeah. I think it's a good news story. So, so yeah, you know, whether you are monogamous or non-monogamous, Whichever relationship style for you feels happiest mm. and healthiest. Good for you. Do the yeah. things that make you happy. Do you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Let's move on to our hot topic. So this is, I feel this is going to be an interesting one, I think, because this is obviously a really wide, wide open subject. You know, mm. there are so, so many aspects so many. to sexual health, physical, mental so many different things and so many different angles of it. And I feel like we're going to try and touch on as many of them as we can. Um, Mm -hmm. But obviously many of these things could be their own podcast topic in their own right. Right. So yeah, well, we're going to try and give the listeners an overview of everything. So (laughs) let's start with kind of the broadest point. What are the most common sexual health problems that women face? So the most common I would say would be things like it, it actually, in fact, I would say the most common would be things that are not necessarily um, passed on through sex. So things mm. like thrush, things like the vag- uh, bacteria vaginosis, which is uh, we call BV. Um, those are the kind of things that we see a lot of from women. And, and I'll explain a little bit about them. So BV and thrush are uh, bacterial infections and they sort of brought upon when the, 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 the pH level in your vagina has to be at a certain level. So when that pH level is thrown off balance, which can be thrown off for several different reasons, um, that can cause a, a thrush outbreak or bacterial vaginosis outbreak. And so we see women come in a lot with these things. And oftentimes, and it's, it's quite tricky with female health because the symptoms for either of them can also be very similar to the symptoms of say chlamydia and gonorrhea so what we find is that women come in the most I'd say complaint when women present with symptoms would be increased amount of discharge maybe pain during sex um, or oftentimes they'll come in with that issue but then other issues might arise during the consultation so it might be things of like you know, maybe not enjoying sex as much, maybe sex is a little bit painful, um, maybe finding it hard to engage during sex, maybe the libido has gone down. So what I'd find is that, yeah, with women, we're a lot more complex when it comes to our bodies, um, especially when it comes to pleasure, when it comes to symptoms, things a lot more. So for, for example, um, chlamydia is the most, is the most common STI. Um, it's very easy to pass on. It's very common, especially among 16 to 25 year olds. And um, what we find is that by the time they present with symptoms, it's when, um, you know, they've had the infection for a, a bit longer. Unlike mm. men who are unlikely to harbor an infection for a long time, men are more likely to present with symptoms earlier than women. So with women, because mm. our vaginas are self-cleansing, our vaginas clean, ourselves, uh, clean themselves. Um, and so discharge is normal for a woman. And so sometimes you can... Your, your discharge might change slightly and it could be due to an infection, but you wouldn't know that because your vagina's discharge is normal for a woman. And so what we find is when women then present to the clinic, it's when they're experiencing pain during sex, maybe abnormal bleeding or what we call spotting, which is when you're bleeding outside of your period. Um, and those are all signs of something called PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, which can be caused by chlamydia after you've had it for quite some time. So what I normally advise women is to do a 
swap the chlamydia and gonorrhea every six months, whether you're in or out of a relationship, just as you would with your smear test. You know, as women in the UK from the age of 25, you have to get a smear test every three years. Mm -hmm. So I would always um, advise women to do a swap of chlamydia and gonorrhea every six months. Because what I find is that a lot of times when women present to clinic, they have symptoms. And sometimes they've been in a relationship for years and there's been no need, you know, to, to have a screen, which is fair enough. But you know, sometimes people in relationship do things outside of the relationship mm-hmm. without informing their partner and things. And so I find that women tend to, you know, when, when a woman presents to a clinic, that they're more likely to present with symptoms that are more complex than, say, a man, because a man is more likely to present with symptoms very soon after catching an infection. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I would say things like discharge, pain during sex, um, and maybe a re- reduced libido as well. These are the, the most common things that women present with in clinic, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Is it... Because you said about um, thrush and BV being quite similar in terms of presentation and, Mm. you know, the same with um, other STIs, or not other STIs, but STIs. Um, Can it be difficult to to diagnose from, like, your point of view as someone who, you know, as a medical professional? Because, you know, when when we talk about these symptoms such as, like, discharge and spotting, like you said, there is mm. such a big range. Like, some women naturally get more discharge than others. Right. And, mm. for example, with spotting, like, especially if you're on birth control. Birth control, right. Yeah. yeah. So does it, do you find that not only maybe is it more difficult to diagnose, but, um, you know, is it one of those things where people end up having things for a long time before they actually realize that they need to seek medical help for it. I think if you're not familiar with, and this is why I'm so big on um, talking to women about what's normal and what's not normal, because every body is different. Every woman is different. You know, we're all, of course we're similar, but Mm. you know, some women have more discharge than, than others. So it's all about knowing what's normal for you. And Mm. then once, once something is sort of out of your normality, then that's what I normally say to women. If something doesn't feel right, and if if it's not your your normal, you know, f- function the way you're used to, then you know, for example, if you're experiencing more discharge than you normally would. Now, during the mo- during the month um, for women, especially when you're ovulating, so about say approximately a week, ten days after your period, that's when women are sort of more likely to become pregnant. And so during that time, your discharge would actually be slightly more, it's a, a little bit different. It might be a little bit more sort of like a gel like, and that mm. and that's kind of normal. So when you're ovulating, your discharge is different. So with women, we kind of know what's normal for us and what's not so if you're finding that oh I'm having a lot more discharge maybe it's thicker so for example with thrush the discharge for thrush is very different to a normal discharge it tends to typically present itself as sort of like cottage cheese type texture Mm. consistency and normally with itchiness and sometimes thrush can be very aggressive it can be really itchy you know you can you know Mm. be scratching quite a lot and then that can then bring on blisters it can be really raw the skin can become inflamed become red become very sensitive Mm. and you can think oh my goodness what's going on and it could be something as simple as thrush and thrush is something that you wouldn't necessarily need to present to a sexual health clinic if you've never had it before then absolutely definitely go and get it diagnosed but some women get thrush some people some women get bv more frequently than than others so they kind of Mm. know so for example um bacteria vaginosis has a very distinct it has very distinct symptoms so it has like a fishy kind of smell to it um, mm-hmm. And any woman, most women would have had it at some point and it can be very distressing. It can really affect your sex life. It can expect, affect your, 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 you know, your, your body image, your confidence in bed and how you feel. And you just don't want to even be intimate with anybody. So it can be something, and I've seen women who get it more often than others. Um, and it can be caused by all sorts of different things. And sometimes it's hard to to figure out what's the root cause of it. So for example, washing Mm. with things like soaps and shower gels can trigger it. Things like having a new partner and having unprotected sex can trigger it. Um, Something, you know, sometimes diet, you know, there's been studies that have suggested maybe your diet could affect it as well. So there's so many different things that can affect it, but it's hard to to get a grip on what that is. But um, yeah, it's one of those super annoying bacteria infections that can <laughs> sort of, you know, it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving is what we yeah. call it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so for women, yeah, it's, it can be very complex. And all of these things, anytime something happens down there, straight away, everyone thinks, okay, it's, it's an STI. Something, uh, Someone's mm-hmm. giving me something. And yeah, it's not always that straightforward. Yeah, so we do, I'd say thrush and BV are the things that women present in clinic with um, the most when they have symptoms. 
That's really interesting. Mm. Do you do you think, I mean, obviously with your line of work, people still feel a bit of shame about seeking help for sexual health issues? Yeah, so there's still a lot of shame attached to it. I think two main reasons I'd say would be um, the influencing factors for it. I said the first reason would be just Obviously, our bodies are our bodies. They're private. And it's very, you know, it doesn't get any more personal than somebody looking at your genitals, let's face it, Mm. you know. (laughs) And it can be, you can be, you know, feeling secure and think, oh, my goodness. You know, if you're lying on a bed with a perfect stranger in a room and your legs are akimbo and you're just completely starkers from the waist down, you know, no, it is uncomfortable. And I completely, and you know, and what I always tell people is it's okay to feel like that because your body is yours and it is a private thing and it's okay to feel like that. It's normal, even for me. And I always tell my patients this as well, but what I always tell to them is that, you know, whoever you go to see, they have chosen to specialize in this specific Mm. field. If we were like, ill or we were squeamish or, you know, we we felt funny about anything like that, we just simply would have chosen a different specialty. Yeah. And and I think that is the main, the the, the most important thing to, um, to remember as a patient or, you know, if you're presenting to a clinic is that whoever you're going to see, has has specialized within this field of sexual health, HIV and all of the rest of it. And so, and so for us, it's normal. And also remember that we've seen, there's nothing that we've not, like there's Mm. nothing that we've not seen. I'll say the other reason why people feel, you know, a bit of shame to, to attend is the, is that people, people are really nervous about the idea of bumping into somebody that they know in a clinic. And I think it comes from the perspective of, I don't want people to think that I'm, quote unquote sleeping around or um because it because it's kind of is this a thing of if you and this is very backwards thinking but it's, it's a very real uh train of thought for a lot of people if you're in a sexual health clinic it means there's something wrong with you it means that you've been sleeping around you've been doing something that you shouldn't have been doing and it couldn't be any mm-hmm. further from the truth at all people go yeah. to the clinic for all sorts of different reasons but also you just it's you know somebody who routinely goes to a clinic and takes responsibility as an adult who's sexually active to go to a clinic and get tested even young people as well that just shows that you're responsible for yourself and Mm. for your partners as well and that you're doing exactly what you should you should be more scared of people who never go to the clinic that's that is who (laughs) is going to take you to the clinic eventually (laughs) at some point is there any particular advice that you give to someone who is feeling embarrassed I mean I know that we've said you know this this reassurance that you know, if you're going to a sexual health mm. clinic, guess what? They've seen it all before and they chose right. to do this. Um, right. Is there any any kind of other advice? Like, you know, I know that um, people worry about, you know, how you like brush your teeth before you go to the dentist. I know mm. that people always worry about, oh, should I shave? Oh, I haven't shaved. Is that bad? Mm. Um, you know, or is there any kind of like little things that you recommend that people do to put their mind at ease. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because also I'm also conscious of the fact that just because it's normal for us doesn't necessarily put somebody's mind at ease. You know, mm. it's still quite a daunting thing for a lot of people. What I'd say is maybe come with a friend to the clinic. I think that always helps. And, uh, and we see that quite often actually. And somebody will come in and say, well, you know, my friend came to sort of support me. I think that's always good. If you have mm. somebody close to you that you feel comfortable with, they can come to the clinic with you and just make it kind of like a day thing. And often what I find is that, and I've seen this happen quite often as well, is that we'd have Two people will come in. One has just come as a friend and the other one's one that, that really wanted to come in and maybe they've got symptoms or they have something that they're worried about. And then the friend would say, oh, um, since I'm, you know, I also decided to book an appointment and just get tested as well. And I've seen it happen so often where the person who came as a supportive friend has, you know, been diagnosed with infection who was not even there for you know, just kind of tested mm. just, just for testing sake. So I, which completely goes off, off the topic that I was off the, um, the, the, mark, the comment I was going to make, but what I would say is come with a friend. That's always good to have uh, moral support in terms of things like shaving. Mm. Don't even worry about things like how, you know, how the garden looks down there. Don't worry if you haven't mown the lawn or anything like that. What I would say is depending, let, let's say, for example, you've come in and you're worried about a spot or you think you've got warts or you think you've got, you think that there's something there that needs to be looked at. Then what I would say, don't shave because shaving can often um, spread things like warts. So maybe you can mm. trim the hair and that might maybe will make it easier to do an examination. So outside of that, that's the only time where I'll say, OK, maybe do shave or, or you know, trim the hair so that we can um, examine and assess your symptoms 
properly. But other than mm. that, I wouldn't worry about going for a wax or it, no. Because also when yeah. you're looking at your genitals down there, obviously we always look at the skin on the outside to make sure that everything's healthy. We check the lymph nodes to make sure they're not raised and just look at the general health from the outside. But essentially, if you're coming in and you say, oh, you know, I've got an increased amount of discharge or I'm experiencing pain when I have sex, I'm experiencing, you know, anal pain or anything like that, then the, the examination is going to be internal and therefore mm. you shouldn't worry too much on what's on the outside. If your yeah. symptoms are on the outside, then yeah, I'll say maybe trim the hair, but don't do it for any sort of aesthetic reasons or anything like that. It shouldn't affect your examination. No. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to talk a little bit about how to check your bits. And right. I don't know that this can be, this maybe won't be like the easiest thing to talk to as this is obviously an audio as well podcast too. Um, but I want, wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, like how often we should check like breast folders, what to look out for if there's like a certain way of doing it or if you just kind of grab and hold on and see what's there. <laughs> And the, the easiest way to do it is when you're in the shower because mm. you're you're there anyway. You're naked, so it's very and you're showering. You know, you're you're showering everything. So that's the that's the best place um, and the easiest to check. So when you're in the shower, just you can do it while you're in the shower, before or at any time. You know, um, just to feel around sort of your breast and what you're looking out for. You're looking out for new lumps in the breast or the underarm slash armpits. So you're looking out for sort of thickening of the skin, any swelling, um, any irritation or dimpling, redness, any sort of flakiness of the skin, particularly the nipple area. So, And, and I know, like you said, it's hard to sort of um, describe it mm. on, on audio, but you sort of want to just sort of, just feel your, just sort of squeeze the breast area, sort of all around down the upper, and just you're just feeling for any sort of lumps, Anything that doesn't feel like it should be there, essentially, any sort of dips and you're sort of feeling, especially with the nipple area, you want to sort of check for redness, any flakiness, any, you know, the, the nipple area is very sensitive, but mm. anything that doesn't feel normal, anything that feel, if you feel a bit sore. So, for example, just before your period, during your period, your, your breasts are going to be very tender. So I'd say that's probably the not the best time to check for that for your, you know, to check your breasts because that's when you, they're going to be more sensitive. So mm. wait when you're not on your period or you're not about to start your period. That would be the best time. I would say at least once every couple of weeks. There's no sort of, there's no real set time to check, but I'd say sort of within a month, if you check at least twice, maybe every couple of weeks and just do that sort of quick check, just feel for lumps, bumps, any redness, flakiness, pain around the nipple area. Um, and also you want to check the armpits as well because people mm. would often just check the breast, but you want to check for lymph nodes and swelling in the armpits as well. So I would say do it every couple of weeks when you're in the shower, just give it a little feel around. And it's also very important for, um, for cisgendered women and anybody with a, with a vagina, with a vulva as well to do that process with your vulva. And the best way to do it is sort of sat in front of a mirror. You can either get a, a mirror that's, you know, there or you can get a small mirror. And what you want to do is just, just, uh, you know, it's, I'm trying to explain it all, all to you, but just grab a, a, a mirror and just have a look and just look. And it's also very good to, to do this because you want to know what, what your vag nobody really knows what their vagina looks like unless you check in mm. the mirror, which, and a lot of women actually don't do it. Um, Cause sometimes I check with my patient and say, how often, do you check your, your vulva? And they're like, oh, I never checked it. I say, and I always say, okay, just maybe once a month, once every couple of weeks, just grab a mirror, have a look down there, just feel for any lumps, anything that, you know, doesn't feel right. Um, and if there's anything that's, you know, that, that you feel, oh, this doesn't, you know, it's a bit painful, or that I've got this lump here that I didn't know, then get it checked out. Nine times out of 10, it's probably going to be nothing because the skin on our vagina is the, skin, is the same as the skin anywhere else in our bodies. You're going to get spots. You're going to get things... Mm -hmm that just come up that have no real explanation. And oftentimes it's just, it's just that it might be. So for example, if you shave, especially you might be more susceptible to ingrown hairs. Ingrown hairs can be very painful and they can be, mm. you can often think that, it, oh gosh, it's, it's a war or it's a, it's, I've got herpes or something. They can be very, very painful. And so we, we see ingrown hairs coming in all the time in clinic. I'd say that's probably another common symptom that women present mm. with as well. Um, but these are, it's good to know what's normal and what's not. And therefore you don't panic when 
something comes up, can you say, okay, well, I had this the other month when I checked and then it went away. So I know that this probably is an ingrown hair. And knowing what's normal is important because then when something presents and it's not normal, then you know that, okay, maybe I need to get this looked at. So I'd say do it maybe once every couple of weeks in the shower, like I said, is the easiest just before you get in or while you're in there and just have a little feel around, have a look, use a mirror, just have a look at your vulva, make sure the skin is intact. Nothing's there that shouldn't be there. Um, and I'll say, yeah, that's the, that's the best way. For women, once you, once you go through quote unquote the change, so once you hit puberty, you know, as a teenager, I think it's good and it's important for parents and guardians and, you know, older siblings and to talk to, especially with young girls about our bodies, because our bodies do change very drastically. And what we're finding is that with 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 um, with younger girls, we're finding that they are developing a lot quicker than, let's say, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm. So you're finding that you find 10 year olds. I've got a friend of mine who's nine-year-old just started her period and she was like beside herself my friend was and she was like how do I talk to a nine-year-old about bodies and I said you know this is a good time to talk to your daughter about what's normal and what to expect and things Mm. like that so that when she does get older she's she's an adult and you know even from that point on you know you have that confidence to know you know that things are normal and you know you know what you're looking out for First of all, I want to talk a little bit about libido. So um, this is something that we get, um, we have a email address for this podcast, which just for any listeners who have forgotten is um, podcast at lovehoney.com. And you are welcome to send us questions. Um, We'll look at doing future episodes on it. Or if we aren't able to do a future episode on it, we'll be able to direct you to other resources and give you some some help. Um, And it's something that we get questions about all the time with libido, Mm. um, especially Mm. for women. And like I said, I know this is a bit of a difficult one to talk about because there are so, so many things that can affect our libido. It can be, I don't know, sometimes like the weather's not right. And I'm like, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) sometimes I haven't had enough food. You know, it's so many things can um, affect libido. Mm. Um, But are there certain changes with libido that can mean something else? Or, you know, are there certain is, is there anything that like a doctor can do to help with libido? Um, yeah. So like you said, it's such, it's a, it's such a complex one libido. Like, because like you said, it could be caused by all sorts of different things. It could be something like, like the weather, you're just not in the mood because mm. the weather's raining and you're just not, you're not feeling it or it's too hot. Or it could be something like a, a, an emotional thing. So it could be maybe having relationship issues. Maybe it could be a confidence thing, a body image thing. It could be things like stress, tiredness but then it can also be you know related to other sort of underlying medical issues such as you know reduced hormone levels um it could be something like you know cause depression can cause libido drop post-pregnancy so women after they've given birth they find that their libido drops so that's completely Mm. normal it could be due to things like excessive alcohol or drug consumption it could be a drop in testosterone levels so it's it's really about figuring out I think it's a process of elimination so for example if a woman comes Mm. in and she says you know I'm just not then we'll do like a, 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 a consultation we'll go through a questionnaire you know, we go. We take down a medical history. Have you had a child recently? Do you suffer from depression? Any recreational drug use? Um, you know, I, do you feel safe and happy in your relationships? So this is a new thing. Well, I'd say maybe about the last couple of years. So we've started, and, and in the clinic where I work, we ask that question to anybody who presents, whether you're coming doesn't matter what you're presenting with we always ask do you feel safe and happy in your relationships um and often not oftentimes but every now and then you might find that people don't feel safe and don't feel feel happy in their relationships and so things like Mm. that could also affect your um your libido things like a drop in testosterone level so from a medical perspective there are things that can be done and it depends it it all depends on the cause of the libido so for example if you have reduced hormone levels that's something that could be seen to if your testosterone if your if your testosterone levels drop as well these are things that can be rectified um also things that there's, and there's things that we can do personally like you know if, if you're experiencing it so things like alcohol and drug consumption these things can affect our libido so for example you can it can be a lifestyle thing so if you make lifestyle changes you can find that that can increase your your sex drive and and sort of 
counteract the libido. Um, and there are other things, things like depression. So if somebody's going through depression, there, you know, there's medical help that you can seek. And then if you then, you know, if you and you know, with depression, there's several ways to to approach it um, in ways of counseling or that you know, there's medication that you can take. So these these are the kind of medical interventions that can um, not only help the cause of the libido being dropped, but also the root of it. If mm. that makes sense. So let's say you're let's say for example you're suffering from depression and you present to your doctor or your nurse and you know you're diagnosed with depression and then your doctor decides to put you on medication for that. You can find that your depression is 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 improved and it's lifted and then because of that, your libido then improves. So oftentimes a libido can be an indication of an underlying problem. Um, and so it can, especially as women, we can sort of brush it off as, oh, I'm just not in the mood. Mm -hmm. But really that can be a sign of something that needs to be addressed, something more serious that needs to be addressed. And so once that is addressed, then you find that your sex life is then improved. So yeah, it is, it's, it's a mm -hmm. minefield when it comes for women and libido, because like even just simply being like tiredness and stress, and especially now with the kind of last year or two that we've had, people are really going through it, you know, um, mm. and things. And now that, you know, lockdown's lifting and like life is sort of getting back to normal before, you know, we, was, we were the only clinic in, in, in London that remained open throughout the pandemic. So we were still seeing people, but we weren't seeing people in the same kind of way. And we weren't as busy for obvious reasons. Mm. But now that things have sort of been lifted a little bit and life has gone back to normal, we now kind of see the knock on effects of, the virus and how it's had an effect on people's mental health, people's relationships with, the, with with each other and with themselves and with their bodies. Things like libido have come up and people not people being, you know, it, and it's, it's kind of gone. It's one. It's kind of gone one. It's one extreme or the other. It's like people are like making up for lost time or people have really regressed and just don't want to engage as much as uh, mm. you know we find. Um, and and you kind of get these conversations in the middle because I'm somebody like I love talking to my patients and we talk about all sorts of things and I mean once you've seen somebody's bits down there I, you know they it, it opens up a floodgates and people do share a lot of you know yeah. their emotional and how they've been and yet it can be caused by so many different things that mm -hmm. it's so important to have these conversations during a consultation because when you do go to a sexual health clinic those are the people that are more likely to to help you than say if you go to a, a, your GP within because yeah. we sort of deal with you know, sex relationships and that kind of element of things. That's utilize your appointment to talk about anything that you might feel like, okay, this is because you can go to a clinic just for a normal checkup and your libido might not even be on you the radar for your appointment. But I, what I would say mm. is take that opportunity to to say, you know, look, I've, I've just not kind of been in the mood for that. And then that conversation can then lead to you actually getting the help that you require. So it's very important to be open and honest as much as you can. Do you think that many people are affected by birth control? Do you think that's a normal thing for people? Or do you think that that's more like of a minority of people who have birth control, take birth control? Yeah, no, birth control is it's an it's another minefield for women because mm. you know what's 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 great for you may be just horrid for me, you know, and vice versa. And there's so many options. And what you find is that anytime you're on some, especially things that have hormones in them, you're gonna find that anything that has hormones in it, more, you know, this is it might throw you off for a little bit. With birth control, what I always say to women is you do have to be patient with it. It mm. does take a good few months sometimes for your body just to get used to this new system that you've put it in, you know? So what we find, especially with um, things like coils, we find that women will have the coil and then they'll get like spotting or bleeding after, which is completely normal. They might get pain. I mean, we've completely invaded your cervix. So it's normal. <laughs> it's normal to experience certain things. So things like pain after having it, maybe spotting after you've had it. So sometimes it can take a few months for your body to be like, okay, well, this is what we're doing now. I'm on board. And, and then you sort of get into a regular routine. But it is common, especially with certain types of pills for some women to experience Things like, like, you know, like depression. So a lot of women, you know, would say, you know, my moods completely change. I remember when I first went on, um, on contraception, I, an uh, oral contraception, I remember the first few months, it really affected my mood. I couldn't stop eating. Like, and, and th this is very common for a lot of women. And it mm -hmm. does nine times out of 10, your body will become used to it. And then you, you will adapt. And then these symptoms will become, will become less and less. But being on contraception can affect certain you know, certain, 
you know, mood disorders and mental health. It absolutely can. Because I remember when I then got off that pill, that specific um, contraception just didn't work for me. But it, like I said, for a lot of women are on it and it's perfect for them. Mm. But that one just didn't work for me personally. And so after, and I did give it a few months and afterwards I said, you know what, this isn't for me. And then I got a different one afterwards and that worked perfectly for me. It's such a catch 22, isn't it? It feels really it unfair. <laughs> I I'm like, what did we do to deserve all of this? But yeah, contraception I know, is- I know, I know. Yeah, I know. And I'm just like, when are they going to come up with one for men so that they can- <laughs> I read you. I remember the out, like, I, I'm still, I still, I read this like quite a while ago and I still have like the hangover from the rage of it. But I remember reading about where they'd invented like a male contraceptive pill and they'd abandoned it in clinical trials because the men were getting the same side effects that women get. <laughs> They've gone, oh, this is really mean. We should stop doing oh, it. Oh, I remember. So- I remember feeling like, are you actually kidding me? Really? Like, no, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, I, fair, yeah it? <laughs> it's really not fair. And, you know, yeah, I find for me, and this is why I advocate for, for women's health so much, because, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, the numbers don't lie. We're still statistically how women are, you know, we are, we do experience the worst side of things when it comes to healthcare. And I feel like we still have a lot of work to be done when it comes to prioritizing women's health. And it's almost seen as, mm. as if you're women, like, you know, you're, you know, it's, it's it's almost seen as part and parcel of being a woman. You just, this is just part of, and there's so many things that women experience that they don't have to experience and that are very straightforward that they can really get help with, you know, without having to jump through fire hoops and stuff. But, but because the services are not there or there's not enough health promotion or, you know, there's, there's shame attached to it or because of societal pressures or being seen like, oh, if you're a woman, you're going to a clinic, it must mean you're sleeping around. And these are the things that affect women because then you find that women feel, like we said earlier, you know, that, that shame that's attached to being a woman who, especially if you're sexually liberated, you know, there's a lot of shame attached to that. And as much as we are moving forward in a society where women feel enabled and powerful and like, yes, you know, you own your body and, you, and your body is yours and you're autonomous to it. But we still, there's still a lot of work to be done with that sort of shame element to it. Mm. And that kind of, whereas men feel very much empowered to present to clinics because men are almost encouraged to sleep around in, in, in a way and, you know, mm. given a high five and a pat on the back for, for doing, you know, certain things. And so therefore they, it's, it's fine. And they feel okay to present to a clinic. So you find that men will, you know, especially when it comes to, it's funny because any sort of other health things, women, you know, you get a headache, we add the GPs. <laughs> the yeah. smallest things we're there. But when it comes to sexual health, there's a, a, that that's when we sort of shy away a little bit as women um, mm. and that's where men feel more empowered I'd, I'd say I feel like this is an ironic point to move on to when we're talking about um you know like how sometimes when we get the the shit under the stick with this mm. um so I just wanted to to finish by talking a bit about menopause and which you know again is one of these things that's very unfair like we already went through puberty why do we have to go through it backwards right um, and then so I was already I was already annoyed where thinking about the fact that we go through basically puberty twice and then oh, right. I found out then I found out very very recently about perimenopause um oh, yeah. which is not something I'd ever heard of before as as a woman and I spoke to a lot of my friends we're all like late 20s early 30s um mm. and I spoke to a lot of a lot of my friends and none of them had ever heard about perimenopause either um would you mind explaining just a little bit about what it is when when we are going to be looking forward to getting it <laughs> so perimenopause as in getting menopause a little bit earlier than expected and and this is and I actually on a more on a, on a personal level I know a couple of women who started getting menopause symptoms in their late 30s which is way too early to be experiencing but it's it's very much a real thing and um you'd find that it's it's a um it's, a, it's, it's almost like a genetic thing. So you find that in certain families, the women just, you, you know, that they, they experience perimenopause. So you, you get the symptoms of menopause earlier than you should do. So if you're a woman in your 30s, you shouldn't really be experiencing menopause. Um, but it's, it is very much a real thing. And it's like you said, it's like a second adolescent experience. Like you're going through and it's just like it's, just, it's like it's almost like, OK, I've just 
finished having the kids. I've just finished all the, and now I'm getting the peri and then I still have to go through it again in another, like, you know, in my forties, fifties. And yeah, you're finding that it's when you start experiencing menopause symptoms earlier than expected. So, you know, hot flashes, um, mood changes, you know, dropping libido, vaginal dryness, all these kind of symptoms that are attached with the menopause, but getting them earlier than expected. Um, and it is very much a real thing. And again, going back to our conversation about libido and things, and because it could be, like we said, signs of something under a medical underlying issue. So that's why it's very important to vocalize if you do feel a drop in your sex drive because like we said it could be something like perimenopause as well mm. and so it's very important because then again like we said if you it, it, you know once we diagnose what could be the cause of this that there, there is medical help you know for it and so it's very important if you are experiencing symptoms of the menopause to be vocal about it there is medical help out there to get, you know, to get help for it. And so things like, you know, vaginal dryness, hot flushes, night sweats. Um, and these are the things, and you can have hormone replacement therapy as well. So you can find that maybe you need to start it a bit early than you could, that you would have um, anticipated. So if you are experiencing this, you don't have to, you don't have to suffer in silence and have all these hot flushes and vaginal dryness. Mm. And things. You could be started on, you know, on hormone therapy and that can, you know, really help and eliminate the symptoms. So I'm going to do some quick fire questions. So like what, what is like the average age for, for women to go through menopause around how long does it last? And is it something where if you start getting symptoms of it you should go to a doctor or do you just kind of ride it out yeah so the average age is about 50 51 that's the average age to experience Mm -hmm. menopause um and you get the so for about four to eight years there's like what we call a transition phase which is what is perimenopause so perimenopause is the transition phase of the menopause um and it begins with changes in the length of time periods and it ends about a year after the final menstrual period. Um, that's how long it sort of lasts on average. Mm. Yeah. Um, but you should, if you're a woman under the age of 50, you know, I'd say, I'd say if you're pre- approaching sort of your mid forties to fifties, that's when you can sort of start to expect it. Um, mm. And it should, it, and it, the good thing about it is that it doesn't last forever. Um, it doesn't, but it's, it's, yeah, almost like, when you're when you know when you're starting your it's, it's like going through the period phase when you're a teenager and you sort of go through those changes but then after a while you kind of you know you become used to having your period kind of thing but with menopause it does those symptoms do subside after some time it's mm. just that sort of that perimenopause phase where and it can last sort of between four to eight years perimenopause whereas you're getting the pre menopause uh, symptoms mm. but the average age is about 50 51 you know, with hormone replacement therapy, is is that just a case of you know if you're if your symptoms are causing like some problems, then then go to a doctor and talk about it. But otherwise, and talk about it, yeah. Because yeah. like we said, we can you can you can start hormone replacement therapy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and you find that women in their thirties, forties, you know, you can start getting these symptoms that are you know quite in line with menopause. And if you are experiencing, especially if they're affecting your day-to-day life, your relationships, your sex drive, your body image is very important because like I said, there is help out there. But a lot of women, like we said, because as women, we're expected to just, yeah, this is part and parcel of being a woman. We don't know Mm -hmm. that there's actually help out there that you can, there's actually therapy, there's medication you can take. There's even things like counseling, you know, there's things Mm -hmm. that you can, that can really help you to to combat the symptoms and to, to deal with them. Yeah. And I suppose there is a little light at the end of the tunnel, just for anyone listening to this who is sitting here like oh great can't wait to do this um I have heard that um a lot of lot of women after going through menopause actually hit a second sexual peak because now they can do what they want live their life when it's over so that is something to look forward to for some people (laughs) Oh, absolutely. And actually, it, there was a very interesting, and I, you know, I should have pulled it up before because this is a very good one. So what we find, what we, uh, we are actually finding is that in the sort of, say, 50 plus community, 
we're actually starting to find more infections in older people because it's almost like people don't, we don't expect our parents and grandparents to still be having sex in their, you know, at a certain age. <laughs> However, they very much are. And yeah. what we're finding is that we do find infection in the older generation because we don't target them when it comes to health promotion for sexual health. A lot of the emphasis is placed on young people because it's like, okay, so you're young, you're out, you're having fun. But actually older people are, uh, actually becoming just as liberated and oftentimes when we're having conversations about you know you know before we're talking about um monogamous relationships and you know one there was a study in america like we said before and like one third of the you know the population said they would want want to be in a non-monogamous relationship but we forget that within that we that includes older people as well. And mm-hmm. they also need to be targeted for, you know, health promotion and sexual health and all these kind of things. And also it's very important, especially for young women to know that life doesn't stop after you, uh, uh, you know, once you, it's, it's almost like once you hit menopause, nobody expects you to want to have sex or to even be able to have sex. It's, it's very weird, but you find that actually once you've gone through all that phase and you've done your menopause, all of that, you're good you almost get your sex life back, you know, yeah. you, don't, you don't have to worry about, oh, my period, I can't have, I can't go on the date this week <laughs> because I have to now wait, you know, so yeah. you kind of, you, 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 you don't have to worry, you know, the risk of pregnancy is gone and, but also you're, you're a bit wiser, more mature, you've kind mm, of been you know there, done want. that, you know yeah, what you, you can want. ask for it. This is yeah. it. You kind of gone through that phase of like, and I find this with myself. The older I get, the more comfortable. Even the things that I used to be insecure about when I was a teenager, when I was in my twenties, yeah. just don't phase me anymore. You know, you kind of the older you get, the more liberated I feel that you become, and you're probably more likely to enjoy sex. The, you know. Th- the older you get because of that, mm. because oftentimes, and especially for women, you'd find that a lot of women say, I just don't enjoy sex. And you think, okay, why? And then, you, you, you know, once you get to the nitty gritty of it and you have a conversation, you find that a lot of times it's, cut, it's to do with their perception, their perception of themselves. Aww. And it's kind of like, and it's, yeah, for sure. And especially, especially with, you know, younger women and especially in this sort of generation of like social media and, you know, mm. we, this, you know, we compare ourselves to so many, to everybody and, you know, we fed, you know, on our feeds, you're constantly, and you don't even have to follow people on social media to be fed all these like body, you know, these perfect quote unquote bodies that are like massively filtered, not real at all. But then, you know, you, and all of us are affected by social media, whether we're conscious Hmm. of it or not. I love that. There we go then. Social media is rubbish. You are hot. Menopause is shit, but there's party rounds too coming afterwards, so don't panic. Absolutely. (laughs) I'm listen, I'm I'm like, bring it on, I can get through it, you know, and then yeah, life will be sweet afterwards. Yeah. Amazing. (laughs) Right. I think I think that brings us to the end of this week's show. So for our listeners to say thank you for listening, we're giving you 15% off of any Love Honey purchase. We've got some links in the episode description, so just scroll down there. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. This has been awesome. Um, oh, it's been how a pleasure. How do people find you online if they want more knowledge from you? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I am on Instagram at Sarah.Melindwa and I'm on Twitter at Sarah Melindwa. And yeah, so I'll be on there. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah I I like talking about that you know we, we, I like to continue the conversation on social media about these kind of things so yeah if anyone ever has any questions love honey are fantastic I do great work with them and we're always pushing and advocating for positivity and for openness and discussing and being open and experimenting um with all kinds of things in terms of sex and relationships and just being positive and having a space to um to vocalize how we feel our wants and our needs and yeah that's where I, you can find me on social media amazing thank you so um listeners if you've enjoyed this week's episode don't forget to give us the rating you think we deserve um you can tell your friends about us drop us a review um, you can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Follow us on YouTube. And as we said, if you have any questions, you can get in touch with us. Um, our email address is podcast at lovehoney.com. And in two weeks' time, we will have a brand new episode for you too. So thank you for listening. Bye. Bye.